So our next speaker, I'm very excited to hear. Uh, her name is Adora Nuodo. She's a software engineer at Microsoft, and uh, she will be speaking all about .NET for infrastructure and automation. Uh, so if Nuodo, yay. Hi, Adora. Hi. Uh, so you can take it away. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, .NET for infrastructure automation, like she said. Um, and the big word here for me is automation, right? Um, we are at this part now where everything that we want to do is like we don't want to spend time doing multiple things at the same time we only want to focus on the things that require our time and we all we want to automate the rest of it and if we look at our lives today a lot of things are automated for us because we have you know virtual assistants i.e cortana to help us do that um we have different applications, different IoT devices that just help make our lives easier. And we are able to use code to automate like different mundane tasks in our lives um, so that we can have time to do things that matter to us a lot. And this picture is, that's actually a picture of my hand. So this picture was taken by me three years ago at my graduation party. And it was a very hectic day for me because, or rather it would have been a very hectic day for me because I planned the party myself, didn't outsource anything. So I had to plan for like food, I had to plan for music, and I had to make sure that people that were coming in were okay and there was power and everything. It was supposed to be a dinner party. and. If not for this thing that we're talking about now, if technology did not exist, it would have been a disaster. But I was able to find playlists to serve as my music, and I was able to order food via an app, and that served as the food. And all I did was just sit back, relax, and enjoy the party that I planned or did it end up planning because I don't know, somebody else somewhere did everything for me, someone else that I did not even know. And this is another example of something that could help, that you could do when you have your time back, right? So you could enjoy with family, you can enjoy with friends, you could go out and do things that you love, you could read a book, you could do a lot. You could do a lot with your time. The time that you get back as a result of being able to automate things, you could do a lot more with that time. So now I've already talked about this before where I said that we use code to automate mundane tasks in our lives. Okay, so now in this talk, I'm going to be sharing with you how you can automate the coding process. And I, before we go on, I want to tell you, or rather I want to reassure you that you're not going to be using, you're not going to be writing code to automate the coding process and then think about writing code to automate the code that you're using to automate the coding process. <laughs> That's not going to happen. What's going to basically happen, what, what, what I'm trying to talk about today is that normally already when we build applications, right, we are we have to deploy these applications somehow. So when you spend time writing code and you're building applications or you're updating apps that already exist, you want to be able to automate the, you want to be able to automate that process in a way. And you also want to be able to automate the deployment of your infrastructure in a way. And that's what this talk is going to be about, how we can write code to automate our infrastructure deployment as opposed to doing it in a very manual or mundane or even in old fashioned infrastructure as code ways. But before we get to the main gist of the day, I would quickly want to introduce myself. My name is Adora, as Kendra mentioned. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft Mixed Reality and I am a tech content creator at Adora Hack. 
Um, Adora Hack is also this the shirt I'm wearing. I'm wearing, by the way, just in case you can see it. It's um, a thing that I created myself. It has a YouTube channel and I have a blog as well. And that's where I share things relating to you know tech and career growth and lifestyle as I'm learning every day because I am a student at life. I'm the co-founder of Unstack, which is a community here in Lagos, Nigeria, that as opposed to you know normal talks, our meetups focus more on hands-on workshops because we believe that many people learn by doing. I'm also on the advisory board of VRARA Nigeria, which is the Nigerian chapter of the Virtual Reality and Augmented Reality Association globally. And you can find me on Twitter at Adora Wodo. Just, you can stop by if you want to say hi. Um, so now let's talk about manual configurations. Before we appreciate what technology has done for us today, before we appreciate where we are now, we need to take, you know, a trip down memory lane just to see what it was before. Um, Right, with manual configurations, deployments are a lot slower because I mean they're done by by us, right? So if you have three different environments that you're supposed to be creating resources for, you're going to have to create all these resources one after the other for these three environments. And that can be slow, and that could also have a potential for introducing errors because you might start creating something and then you do, the first one you create might be done properly and then the second one you might miss out something and for that kind of thing as well as you create these resources as you try to configure what your what the infrastructure for your application should look like you're supposed to be documenting you know as you go, because that's what everyone is going to be paying attention to. That's what everyone on your team, everyone working on this product that is going to be on that side is going to be relying on. And if anything happens for whatever reason and you have to you know, roll back, it's not as easy as or oh, going to you know, revert a change in a PR that you made that spot something because this requires manual work in a way. And it's just, it's a bit harder. It's kind of like suffering, to be honest. And that's kind of like a serious recipe for disaster. I'm going to talk about one very terrible thing that happens with manual configuration, which is configuration drift. And now let's look at, let's look at um, our three environments. So we have our dev environments, we have our, staging environment and we also have our production environment um when we started out right our dev environment our staging environment and our production environment looked alike right they only had a few different and a few things that were differentiating them like let's say the config if i was if i had a web app for example right um the app service plan that I'm using might have been like a different tier. In this case, we have an Azure Function app, we have Cosmos DB, we have a key vault, and we have a storage account and some other configs in, in each environment. But let's say something happens, I don't know, I'm on call and something goes wrong in production and it triggers an alert and then I see and then I see this alert and then I have to you know go and fix it. And in the course of me fixing this thing, I make an edit to I make an update to my production environment and this happens. So now my production environment, my staging environment doesn't mirror my production environment anymore. The production environment is slowly drifting away from the original way that it was configured and that would be a problem. So now enter infrastructure as code. With all those things that I've said, I've talked about these things a lot. Why is IAC infrastructure as code important? Configurations are specified in code, right? Everything you do, you're not going to, anything you do, nothing you do is going to be manual. Everything you do is going to be written as code and then is going to be automated in some way. So this prevents, you know, the issues that we were already 
that I already talked about. You can test, you can version, and you can roll back your infrastructure gracefully. Um, and I used the Git example. I used reversing a PR that made everything just, you know, break essentially reverting that PR and taking your application back to a state that worked. And you can also do this with your infrastructure. If you write code to maybe add a new resource, if you write code to add a new resource to your infrastructure and for whatever reason, something happens along the way, you could easily roll back and then figure out what happened and then fix it and everyone will be okay. The next thing is um, you can automate your infrastructure deployments. So you can you can do infrastructure as code and with your CI CD, and that could help automate the entire process, your infrastructure deployment, your code deployments in one pipeline. And all you had to do was just define what resources you want in code. And why are we using .NET? Okay, first of all, because we are at a .NET conference. And the next thing would be familiarity. My guess is a lot of people here either watch, a lot of people here watching either are familiar with the .NET stack or want to get familiar with the .NET stack. So this is a good place to start. You can reuse different coding constructs. You can express yourself in any way you'd like to express yourself in using different um, programming constructs that you like, programming in any way that you, you know, like to program. And it also makes you productive because you have access to these different IDEs. You have access to these different tools and these other different things when you're writing .NET that makes your life a lot easier. So imagine, having access to these tools as well when you're writing code for your apps and when you're writing code that defines the resources in your infrastructure. This is how you would define an Azure storage account in C Sharp if you were using an infrastructure as code tool called Pulumi. Pulumi is a modern infrastructure as code tool that helps you um, you know, create and manage your applications, infrastructure with real life programming languages that you already are familiar with. So you don't need to, you know, go and start learning something new. It helps you transfer your skills from one domain to the other. When I picked it up, it was pretty easy. I mean, I had to do some reading and I had to learn a bit, but it would have been easier than if I had to pick up an entirely new language, an entirely new way of doing things from the very beginning. Because I mean, I already write C Sharp, I already write TypeScript. If you already write Python, if you already write Go, that's great. You could just take that energy <laughs> into Pulumi and you can create all your infrastructure. And I think that that's something that is really amazing. So now let's get right into the case study of the day. Let's get right into using .NET to automate our infrastructure. And I'm going to introduce my friend here who happens to be a stick figure. Her name is Oge. Oge needs to create infrastructure for an Azure Functions app and deploy this to two environments, a dev environment and a production environment. So here's a list of resources that she needs. She needs an app service plan. She needs a storage account and she needs a function app resource. So the first thing that I would do for Oge is to go to Azure and create a storage account. Um, I'm creating a storage account manually, however, because Pulumi has two options for saving the state of your infrastructure. So that's how Pulumi works, right? It saves the state of the current infrastructure that you that you have in the entire application and based on that state if you want to do an update it checks in with the state to know you know what you're creating what you're updating what you're deleting what you're replacing so you can choose to use pulumi's cloud or you can choose to have your own custom backend so i am going to azure to create a storage account because i want to use my storage account as my own custom backend so i'm going to create a storage account I'll call it Pulumi Store. 
And then I'm going to create a container and I'm going to call it Pulumi container. I'm going to create that storage container in my Pulumi store storage account. So now once I have that, I would keep the name of my storage container, the name of my storage account and my storage account key somewhere because I'm going to need it in this next step. So now I launch PowerShell or any terminal that I like. Well, I can't launch PowerShell for this talk, so we just have to deal with PowerPoint. So we're going to log into Azure CLI, first of all, so that we can be authenticated and we can do all the things we want to do with Pulumi. If you are doing this on the pipeline, you would be using a service principal authentication, which is different from using AZ CLI. But for the sake of this, we're going to log into Azure CLI. And now we have to set the environment variables we have to set the name of our storage account and we have to set the storage account key environment variables respectively, then we need to install Pulumi. So I'm doing Choco install because I am on Windows, but if I was on a Mac, I would probably use Brew. And if I was on Linux, I would do it in a different way. And you can install this manually as well. You can always go to the Pulumi site and install Pulumi manually, but I am doing Choco install right here. I am creating an IAC working directory and CDing into that directory so that I can do all my Pulumi things there. And the next thing I'm going to do after that is log into Pulumi. I'm going to log in to my storage container as the backend, right? So that Pulumi, so that Pulumi can authenticate with Azure. Pulumi knows that my storage account is the back end and whatever state is saved in that back end is the current state of my infrastructure. And the name of my storage account, um, name of my storage container is Pulumi container. So I log into that and then I create a new Pulumi project in C Sharp. And once I do this, this is what my terminal would look like. And then once you want to create the project, it's like a wizard. So they're going to ask you for the name of the project, the description, if you want to describe it, the name of your stack, right? So they're going to ask you for the name of your stack. And um, the first stack I created is a dev stack. And then because Oge wants to deploy this to two environments, I also created a prod stack. So think of a stack as a configuration for the different environments that you might have. So it might be different environments, it might be different regions, but you could you could have your stack and your stack would have files, different files. So because I have a dev stack and a prod stack, I have a polymer.dev.yaml and I have a polymer.prod.yaml. So I can decide to add my own configs that I feel should be different. So if I have a dev stack, for example, and I want all my resources in dev to be deployed to West Europe, I can add West, I can add the location in my config as West Europe. And then in my code, I can reference whatever the value of my config is and pass it as the locations that I want to be creating in. And this just allows me to specify things that would be different in the different configs in the different stacks that I have. If I'm doing an app service plan and I'm thinking about, I don't need to have a premium, you know, size or a premium tier for my dev stack. I could have my dev stack be a standard tier and I could have my production um, stack be a premium V2. So I could specify different things in the different stacks and that's, is not in any way coupled with the code I'm writing. All that Pulumi knows is that when Pulumi is running all the commands it needs to run to update my infrastructure based on what stack I'm currently on, Pulumi goes ahead to do what Pulumi has to do. And this, like, you know, your program, this is your product, your program, the CS. And like your start of the CS, if you were in Azure Functions, for example, this program, the CS, is the entry point to the code you're writing. And then what happens is that in your main method, you're calling deployment or running sync, and you're passing in the name of your class, which is my stack. So my stack is the name of the class 
where I am going to be defining all the polluting resources that I need. And it's it inherits um, the base class called stack. So this is my own version of my stack, right? I'm calling it my function app because I want to create a function app. I want to create an app service plan. I want to create a storage account as well. So I create my own function app and I, you know, inherit from the base class called stack. And I create my function app constructor. I have all of my, I have all of, I specify all the names of the different resources I'm going to create and I leave them in these different constants that are here. And I create a method called get app settings map because my app settings should be an input map of strings. So I want to create a method that basically constructs the app settings map before I go ahead to add it to my function app. So now I also have an output at the end when I am done, you know, creating all the resources I'm going to be creating in my function app, I want to return the function app URL. So I have this output string here as what I'm going to be returning. So now this is what my get app settings map method would look like. Um, I just want to specify a cloud service config and I want to set the cloud service config to whatever my configurations environment variable config is. And if we go back here, the env, the env config in Pulumido dev is dev and the env, the env config in the other one is, is as it should be as well. So I set that and then I return my app setting and then I go ahead to you know, get my app service plan size, my app service plan tier, what my environment is and what my location is. I go ahead to get all of these things from my config and I just have them saved in my variables to use when I'm ready to use them. I go ahead and create the resource group because everything I create should be in a resource group. So I go ahead and I create a resource group with the resource group name that I specified. I'm passing the env also as part of the name just so that I know which resource group is a dev resource group and which resource group is a prod resource group. So I'm creating a resource group in the location specified and I'm passing the name of the resource group. I'm going ahead to create a storage account. So as opposed to doing this manually, I am doing this by writing code. So I'm writing code to create a resource group. I'm writing code to create a storage account. I'm writing code to create an app service plan and I'm writing code that is going to create my function app. I'm passing in the name of the app. I'm passing in the storage account name because my function app needs a storage account. I'm passing in the ID of my app service plan location, the access key of my storage account, my resource group name and the type, the identity that I want. I want a system assigned identity, the version of my of my function app, my app settings, and my site configs. So I'm passing in all these things. And the first time I was talking about running a Pulumi um, program that you specify, um, I said that you could use deployment or run async and pass in the name of the class that implements stack. Another way you could do this is you could still have deployment or run async, but now you can create an instance of the class. You can create an instance of the class you created that has all the resources defined in them, just in case you want to have access to the outputs. Because if you had done it in this way, you wouldn't have access to the outputs, which is our function app URL. In case you need to pass the function app URL somewhere else or you want to do something, writing it this way could help you achieve that. So now here, I like I said, if you look at the code, I created a resource group, I created a storage account, an app service plan, and a function app. All we need to do at this point is run a Pulumi up. And once we run the Pulumi or Pulumi is going to, you know, go ahead and deploy all these 
and create this infrastructure for me in Azure. And if I go to the Azure portal, I'm going to see it there, right? And this is clearly it, right? So we created, we can see that the sample Pulumi app dev, sample Pulumi plan dev, and sample Pulumi store dev are three resources under the resource group sample Pulumi RG dev. If you want to cross check the names, you could go back. So I was when I was getting ready for this talk, I actually wrote the code and did the deployment. So I took this screenshot as I was creating, and then I went to the portal immediately. It was done and took this screenshot as well. So a few weeks later, the thing I talked about state with Pulumi. A few weeks later, um, Oge comes and she wants to you know update her app and she wants to add a key vault to her infra so that she, she can securely manage secrets. I don't want to spend time, you know, talking about this here because it might mean, it might mean like a few extra minutes, but I created this repo on GitHub. You can actually go and check it out. And this has the code for creating a function app and creating everything you need with um, even the, and creating everything you need, even with the key vault. So you can go ahead and check this out. But I still took another screenshot of what it looked like after the, the second deployment, which was the key vault deployment. So the initial deployment two weeks ago was, you know, me creating the resource group account, um, app service plan and function app for OGE. And then in the next week or in the next two weeks, I have to create, you know, a key vault. I have to add a secret to that key vault. Everything is done in Pulumi, by the way. And I have to set access policies on my key vault. And now if we look at what's currently happening here in the second terminal, we would see that, or let's go to the first terminal first. We would see that we have five resources to create and Pulumi creates these five resources which is, you know, my custom resource and then the resource group, the accounts, the plan and the function app. These other four resources are in my custom resources, my custom resource and that's why it's five. So now let's go to two weeks after, right? I have my custom resource already. So Pulumi isn't creating that again because I just added it to the my function app class. I didn't go and create like a new class. So now we can see here, that the terminal says four to create and five unchanged, meaning nothing is going to happen to these five resources that I already had created. And Pulumi is aware that these five resources are there. And then I'm just going to create four more resources and get them added to that without tampering with these other five resources. And if I want to go ahead and delete one of the five, I would see it in the terminal. I would see Pulumi telling me to delete in the terminal as well. So Pulumi manages all of that for you. All you need to do is write the code to manage your infrastructure and Pulumi worries about, you know, the state, what it's creating, what it's deleting and how to go around managing the entire process. So write your code, run your Pulumi up to update your infrastructure, deploy your code to that infrastructure, go to sleep. That's all you need to do. If you need more information about doing infrastructure engineering with Pulumi. Um, you can go to the Pulumi website. I think it's very comprehensive, actually. Um, I didn't need like any external things. Very, It's well written and it's easy to pick up. I also wrote an article on this a few months ago. And there's also um, an article on dev blogs where you can go read and it could help you understand how to like build modern cloud applications with Pulumi and .NET Core. You could also look at this Medium article written by my coworker, Kende. Um, she shared some lights on what infrastructure as code is and how you can get started and the differences between, you know, declarative and imperative ways of doing IEC. Thank you so much for joining this talk. Thank you so much, Adora. That was so cool. I always love seeing some Pulomi shout outs and uh, sharing your code at the end. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Um, 
kind of as you say, uh, DevOps as code gets to benefit from like source control and whatnot. And then also being able to share DevOps scripts and everything on GitHub because they're now tracked and they're now, you know, all like explicitly written out. It's just, it's a cool world to be in. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you.